Yeah, should we start? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Le, uh, let me, uh, le, let's, let's ask. We need to get those guys to tell us that is this. No, because, no, we cannot start. The cameras are not ready yet. <coughs> Do we need to get everything on camera? Uh, this, this is the only room where they'll be streaming, obviously. Like Very beautiful. I'm, I'm happy. This is Bollywood. No, it's, uh, this is... Bollywood. Mzandiwood. Mzandi Forest. Mzandi Forest. <laughs> Concrete jungle. Concrete jungle. <laughs> ah, our very own. None like us. Exactly. You know, there's no hill for in America. Yeah, so, so let's we must be happy bra. that we have hill for in South Africa. The bra. Yeah. And then Bram. The the no, yeah, we we're gonna start. The technical guys have to come start, and once they start shooting, then I think we're gonna be good, so that we don't have. Your Harlot needs to be there. If IDC is one of our co-financiers, they need to be on board by the time we disperse and so forth. Um, your distribution and yeah. But yeah. And Andy, is that a commitment? Three months once the application has arrived at your door, you will have resolved on whether you're supporting it or not? No, it's not. Not yet. Okay. Let's talk about that further in the discussion. which is known as disruption and innovation. So as is of Moshe's courtesy, this is of a and hopefully uh, a lot of questions will be will be answered and important factors will be addressed. So, Ngalanje, which is true, bigger thing as a small shish cut. Max. You say Max. We've got to get this right. Okay, go back. Um, okay. Please go back. Okay, I'm Pat, I'm the co facilitator. Menangulung Zanem Tetra, co facilitator as well. And uh, just to give you a little bit of that, we'll have a, a session now and then you'll all be expected to jo join the work group, of which we'll all then be doing a report back to the plenary. Okay, uh, I'm just going to get to the rules of engagement because it's very important that we understand the rules of engagement in this house. Um, I would we would propose that during the session, can we have everyone listen to each other? even though we're going to have a, a heated and robust uh, 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 session. But And another thing, we, 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 we just humbly request that there won't, there, there won't be any personal attacks because we, we, we don't want that. I, I don't want to see Mr. Kachiso Sega Kichime stage because one of the, uh, 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 my, my mother's or father's down there, would, hey, I know this one. Um, Masit Kubega, um, Without wasting any further time, we just uh, see respect from both uh, uh, generations, young people and old people. But let's have a good session at the end of the day and enjoy the session. Okay, and just to make sure you're all on theme C, which is disruption and innovation in the value chain, changing patterns of development, financing, production, distribution, exhibition models content consumption and market access are we geared for change and this is really about disruption you know but one thing i'm thinking is that in joba today we are gathered here talking about disruption and innovation in the value chain the honest truth is with no content there's no disruption technology is useless if there's no content and that content that comes from us so I want to start off this session by really disrupting and giving our young lions, 
our young people an opportunity to come and disrupt this session. So over to you guys. I greet you all, kings and queens. Ikamao Nobo, also known as Sabotage, all the way from the East End. I'm about to disrupt this whole aim, this whole thing right now by kicking off a 16 bars that talks about African spirituality, which is an it's it's our culture, it's our heritage, it's an African content. So I'm just gonna go straight to it without any waste of time. It goes like you cannot kill the God I'm on a spiritual path. Civilized up with the science and subliminal math. Indigenous facts encoded by the universe black. I'm the equivalent of Mike Tyson if he rapped. The punches are throw evolved to a spiritual blow. The lyrics are throw emit enlightenment in the know. The knowledge it grows. The force of wisdom stretching it slow. It's written in codes exposed in the pyramid stones. I pay homage to the ancestors for knowledge of self. They died for the cause. Identity is lost in the shelves. Most of my brethren are still on three dimension lockdown. The walking dead with eyes closed. You should claim back your crown. We possess spiritual power that surpasses evolution. With the wisdom of the gods, we can start the revolution. Spark the dead eye. Incorporate higher knowledge into lyrics. Know yourself is the ascension beyond the system limits. I give thanks. Here is Jake Blair. Afternoon. I'm Linda Guse, known also known as MLT. I won't belong like him, just a pisnyan. It goes like I speak the truth and I hate the lie. I won't wear fancy clothes, good day in July. I will take a taxi to Dubai or maybe take a plane from Josie to Kasi. Rappers must take a seat, but I'm sure I'm always on the move. I'm busy on my guy, I'm not running Sunday school. I'm not going to be a bar on fire, busy still my Lilo. I know I am short, but I'm always high. I'm not going to be been smoking since yesterday, that's why I'm not going to be a bar. Pay attention, I'm not going to be a bar. Hey, Chief Tatsoti. Chief Tato, Tigu figure on pet, tang, chasing up on it, losing shang a perfume and pet, pangili, malia gazi, like always. I'll try use the word propaganda, so can the proper au span a court song, the lung and chachi, abo, chair bamanja, bashelong a mali, abom repabating a plan ganding and zangatang bone, little the human trafficking, mang peranyak joncha, Nizanes vung vung, jola no dinner. Is this? A revolution or another form of mental pollution? You see, I always ask myself this question and I never reach a conclusion. Leading me to one. What is it? Very careful. <laughs> what is it that we hear? Is it the emptiness with me that Jesus to Found our sorrows in bottles and bottles and bottles of vodka and gin. You see, I may not be a prophet or a well-renowned whatever it is. You see, all I seek is for the enlightenment of the young black man. Crucial. Ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome. Give yourselves a round of applause. Yes. We should be able to get to the game. We're going to be able to get to the game. We should be able to get to the game. Gunen Kotle and Jalani Kamalam Mundot is Bongo, Gubenin Zalini Kesale, Wanon Gome, Panganomis Kot, Mumalus with the Galang, Soma Pungu Sotondos. Kutelo was Yoga to Akfumu, Wooting Tool, Pelamina, Gis Tunus and Kosi, but it was no place like home. Very there is no place like home, Goba Pella, I'll say Kutando, Segnet Zondo, Umamagasala, Lintin, Segala Malund, Nobab Zondo, Impilinzi, Massa Pendugi, Morton, Goba Stonsa, Goker Wan, and Alaba Fasa Basen and Dab, Dem Zimbaya was about Pidis away, why? Bakichi Missy Mari, no boom nant, Baba Chalanga Sonto, Batin Koloyani Seba, Tasangom Zimbe Hill, Probiti Koli Mali Vel, 
The entire business cuts so cheap because Zinga go back to time is money. Go to another Baba Namara Stabano, who's still a man, a business for Melan and Abo, City Yamandi, Ipova, Nasabaita, Latina, Bamyama, and Weba and Gobapella, says Pentagama Church, accountant, and Maruxini, Snarama Cancula, says his Balabala, and his safe is Tifar, Maxon, you look at some politician, Ayakankas, the propaganda is a rigifar. Nati says to Willis, somebody and Colonel Emma Coroniza, Sistun Salaba Pants. Monte Abula and Jang and Kukumava Kataba Kent and my body parts. I got so she punkulunkuru se kitchen missing man. In gonna stito in ten man, eight to lie. I'm a hen again, I'm a corona lama party in Gapasico United. Stivata lama political party says forget these cards. It's for some sip clones or quetelli quetella petama herbs than a gunin who's on killer. You won't allow Baba sneaking Kululego and then so on to Mutom Yama chain to a drug dealer. It's rare to look and nick foot. Second, modify old and let's effect quite a better. I doubt it, Banga Hila got to a good yellow as your mena. A boom. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when we talk about disruption and innovation in the value chain, we talk about technology, but yet we forget the content, and that is content that you've just experienced there. Please give these young people a round of an applause. Okay, I'm just going to, we're going to start off with Dimitri Martinez. Who's going to do? Who's going to present um, for us today? He's a development sociologist specializing in media research and information. If you can read up there, he has a long CV. Um, you probably all know him from the NFEF. Um, I'm also going to just quickly introduce our panelists. Um, Ms. Nomsa Paliso is being replaced by Nirvana Singh. Nirvana Singh is head of industry development at the SABC. I think that um, Nomsa may arrive, but then you'll both sit on the panel. But thank you very much, Nirvana. And then um, we have Fidoz Babulia, is a director, producer, writer, and educator. She has many accolades to her name, including working in the industry. Um, Ms. Isabella Rob, can you stand up so everyone can see you? I, d I think on the other side of the room. Thank you. Um, Isabella used to run a fantastic company called An Amazing um, Animation, and she now has Enlightened Poppy Network. Um, it's an impact innovation consultancy in the ICT sector. Our next panelist, sorry, I am just have moved it too far. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Dumi Gumbi, the Ergo Company, and you used to also run an amazing company. Yes. He also used to be in animation, but he now does feature film development, and one of your latest films was Five Fingers for Marseille. Um, then followed by Mr. Kakiso Ledicha, and everyone knows Kakiso is a comedian, but he's also an actor, a director, a performer, and he presently has a fantastic series that's going out, that is going to be made with Netflix, and he has a film in the cinemas at the moment. Please go and support, support it, Matetwe. 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 Yes. <laughs> okay, so what we're gonna do then is start off with Fido, uh, for, with the presenter, and then we'll go straight on to the panelists. Okay, uh, I would like to share something just very brief as we are here Kadat, talking about disruption and innovation. Disruption and innovation has really changed the way um, our consumers consume content. Uh, through disruption, the reality of it is that print media is slowly dying, and we, 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 we are all witness to that. And our traditional TV is in a coma because 
everyone wants to now watch or stream their content on their mobile phones and there's no time for, for you to read newspapers or even watch TV like we used to do back in the day. But with that being said, innovation is proving that content can be accessed and streamed faster and easier thanks to technology and the access to internet and portable devices. Even though data is expensive, it also deprives us as young people and everyone of that accessing to that information. So in my view, I would say data must fall. No data, everything will become easy, life will become easier. Um, for example, I want to use countries like Rwanda that lead by example. Um, in countries like Rwanda, they've nationalized a uh, 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 Wi-Fi. So all the citizens of the country, especially young people, they are exposed to free internet service and Wi-Fi, which is something I would really consider our government thinking about and having to implement that. We understand that we do have free Wi-Fi spots, but I feel that they're not enough. More can be done. Um, just like the, uh, uh, an individual, uh, Nkosana Makatu, the, 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 the man who came with this please call message. This is a man who's been stripped of his innovation and deprived of his legacy with the please call me service. It's, it, that, that is a disruption innovation because if you go back uh, in the days, when your airtime is finished, you are left with no options but to just sit or borrow people's phones. But through innovate, innovative thinking, he then came with this uh, a, a message called please call me where when you are in trouble you are able to access uh, people that are, are far from you and such people is people that we need to support with innovation uh, innovation innovative thinking um, because of disruption and innovation we can now fit in content into our schedules which is something that we never had back in the years typical example when I was growing up Generation used to play from Tuesday to Thursday at half past seven. And then after that, you'd have a gap. If you fail to watch the episodes that would, pay, would play within the three days, just know what you say, Baba. You won't get to see another generation unless you see another episode. But through disruption and innovation, we are now allowed, we are now able to do what we call, we record our, 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 our content, and then we just catch up. But my then question would then be, with all this dis disruption and, and, and innovation that has taken place in the value chain, where is the SAPC? And what is the national broadcaster doing for our creative in this country? So I won't waste any more time. Yes, we are here to talk about your Showmax and your Netflix. But in Menangizotelukuti, all Showmax and all Netflix, let's talk about what really affects us. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think, actually, our work is done after what, everything you've said at all. I mean, uh, <laughs> um, the, the, the presentation uh, really um, is to try and understand why are we actually speaking about disruption today? Um, wh what are the roots of, of, of these changes, these seismic changes that have taken place uh, within our industry and, in fact, beyond? Um, what is this new industrial revolution that uh, is more important than tradition? Well, it's all about digital. So I'm going to look at the uh, rise, essentially, of this idea of a digital economy, digital society, because it's in the, that context that disruption was able to happen. So. Just as, as sort of opening statements, disruption doesn't care about formats. Disruption doesn't care about established value chains. Disruption doesn't care for definitions. Disruption doesn't care for national boundaries. In fact, disruption doesn't care about anything. Secondly, when we talk about digital, let's remember digital is not just about DTT digital terrestrial television. Digital is really about a sea change, and I think I'd like to use that um, as my, thanks, 
So I'm going to touch on four, four topics. Uh, we've been speaking about broadcast digital migration uh, and the digital switchover. So just to be clear on, on the difference, I'm also going to talk on some digital basics because it's clear when, when you speak to people, you hear there's a lot of confusion uh, um, on, on certain key, key issues. So I'm going to just touch on those, including what do we mean by convergence? and out of convergence coming these over-the-top applications and services. And finally, as a way of wrapping up, let's have a look at, at the film sector itself, because it's certainly, and, and the point that I made about disruption, not caring about boundaries and so on, the very idea of a film sector, of a film industry, in its, is, is, is now brought to question. Thanks. So, let's make the distinction. The digital switch over is the result. So, it's once the processes have actually been completed that we can say that there has been a digital switch over. That we've moved from an analog platform to a digital platform. Now, digitization is really your much longer term process of modernization and that's why I say DT, uh, digital is not just about DTT it's about a complete change in the way that we manage businesses the way in which we produce and consume so it's this modernization process essentially this digitization that has brought about the convergence of three different three previously separate uh, platforms. Thank you. The other important issue, this is the new gold. I think maybe I should hold this because I move around quite a bit. So, Spectrum, and I'm going to, I'm gonna, I've got another slide on this one. Essentially, Spectrum that was previously assigned for broadcasting that spectrum is what is referred to as the digital dividend when broadcasters finally move off that spectrum and uh, we use that same spectrum to deliver a whole range of electronic communication services. Uh, Wi-Fi, wireless broadband uh, are two of the most uh, uh, important there, but there's a whole range of new services. Thank you. So... If you can picture the frequency spectrum, and now this is purely for illustration purposes, please don't confuse this with the rainbow or the visible part of the, of the spectrum. Now, each of those colors represents a different frequency band, and within there, you can only do certain things. So, in the, in the uh, blue space, you can only do blue things just to keep it simple. So, uh, operating your remote control, uh, you don't want a situation where you, you press a remote control for your gate and the TV set changes. They operate on different frequencies precisely for, for those reasons. Now, with digitization, what happens? If you have a look at the one from the right, one, two, three, that band, what happens with uh, digitization, we are able then to take data, compress data, which means you can fit more channels into the same space that was previously occupied by one TV channel, for example. So the spectrum that is currently used by a single TV channel or a radio station operating uh, in the lower frequency bands, that still exists. Remember, the airwaves, it's a natural resource like water. Now, we are able to do a lot more in that space. So that's one of the major disruptive forces in the, uh, at the communication sector. Thanks. Now, we had a roadmap to migrate to digital. We were meant to do the switch over by the 15th, uh, 17th of June 2015.
we've obviously missed that deadline, and we're now aiming at, uh, uh, I understand, either 2019, according to Minister of Communications, possibly 2020. But the important thing is that you do a switch on, you then have a switch off. Once you've had the switch off, there is another migration. So it's, not, it's, it's a process where essentially people move into your house for a couple of weeks while their new house is being built, and then they move out. It's the equivalent sort of thing. So people will be moving in from, from digi uh, first analog to digital, and then digital to digital, restacking, they call it. Thank you. That's to give you an idea of South Africa at the moment. The areas in green is where you will be able to receive a digital terrestrial signal. The areas that are in orange are areas that are not very uh, populated, and those areas will essentially be using satellite dishes to receive their services. So satellite, remember, covers the entire country. It doesn't just target the little orange areas, and it's been one of the misconceptions that we're saying, oh, 86% of the country will get their signal via DTT, and the other 16 will get it by satellite. It's not how it works. Satellite has a massive footprint. So anybody who wants to receive their channels, whether it's the SABC channels, ETV, any of the new players, will be able to receive it via satellite anywhere in the country or on the terrestrial platform. Am I rambling? Okay, I better move on. Can we go, please? Um, we've taken 15 years so far and we're not there. Countries, uh, that's the number of years they've taken to switch over. UK, Spain, Italy, 10 years, 14 years. So even highly developed countries uh, took a while to switch. Thank you. Okay. Um, part of the disruption is precisely this basic communication pro uh, process. We've got somebody who wants to send somebody a message. Okay, next one. That's no longer the case. We are uh, moving uh, what uh, I have to, since I'm standing in for a, a, a really um, impressive academic, I've got to use one academic reference. And that's a guy called Manuel Castells, who's written an amazing book called The Network Society. And he says that we are in the era of mass self-communication. We're not in the era of mass communication, but self. Thank you. So, telecoms, that's how a telecoms network is built. All signals go one way. Next, a broadcast network is a point to multipoint. Okay, next. That's the internet. So, we've got... When we talk about convergence, and it's going to be the next slide or so, anyone can speak to many. The previous one was one speaks to one, or one speaks to many, which is the broadcast model. That's actually more correctly. That's what the uh, internet uh, connections. Does it remind you of anything? A brain. And your neural, the, the neurons in the brain. Thank you. So, summary, point-to-point point and point-to-multipoint. Point. These are very important uh, concepts because it's on this basis that networks are designed. And, you know, there's only a certain way that you can get your content to a consumer. There are three ways. You can go via cable, you can go over the air, terrestrial, or you can go via satellite. A satellite is simply a transmitter located in the sky. That's all it, it does there. Thank you. Okay. So, the idea of entering a fourth industrial revolution. So, the idea, revolution essentially, if we, well, the, the good Marxists will tell us, it's a change in the mode of production. It's a change in the way in which we produce and consume. 
So having been through the three, we are currently in the fourth. We mustn't talk about the fourth as if it's coming next year or 2020 or whatever. It's, we're already in it. We already have artificial intelligence in our phones, etc. So, um, you've, you've, you've been given this. Let's go one, two, three slides, please. Okay. That's it. So, just as a way of wrapping up, just to be clear now, when we talk about these over-the-top services, and whether over-the-top is actually a threat, or whether over-the-top is actually an opportunity, um, so if we're trying to control over-the-top, are we stifling innovation? Or has the disruptive nature of these technologies actually opened up new opportunities for filmmakers? Thank you. Next slide, please. Analog, analog. On the right, you had the internet. The bottom, you had telecoms. Now, this red circle in the middle is your new digital uh, market in South Africa. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is the same thing from another point of view. Just focus in the middle now, because essentially that is what this convergence process digitization has made possible. The sweet spot is the interactive multimedia in the center of that, of that screen. So previously, we were working in that bottom right-hand corner, you could say. Audiovisual products, film, music, I, I think it might be chopping off, but you'll see it there, right. Um, broadcast and online, and bringing in your network equipment, suddenly, your cons from concept to consumer, that whole thing has been telescoped into a much more direct connection. You, as a producer, have a direct link with your um, consumer. Um, this was just really to give you an idea. When we talk about over the top, there are four categories, really. Communications, media, that's the one we all like, YouTube, Netflix, etc. Commerce, and social media. So, again, this is all in the hands of producers today. You can be operating right across. You can put in a pay, uh, a transaction-based thing onto a basic website, and you can start selling your own content directly. You'll ask, how do people know you exist? That's why we need the SABC. Okay? Um, this was the prediction for 2017. Over the top video, if you look at how small the little chunk is, but music, online games, and this is the point that I was making earlier, that the, the industry as we knew it, with, with its very clear boundaries, it's very, it's, that is precisely what has been disrupted. So, when we talk about our industry, I want you to give uh, one example. Take a seamstress who's working uh, on a an, uh, feature film. That same person also does um, uh, costumes for the uh, Joburg Theatre. That same person also sews outfits and she sells them at, uh, at a retail store she has. So which industry is she in? Do we own her because she happens to be doing amazing work. So the idea of this industry having very clear boundaries, people are moving between these different industries and it's being made possible by technology. So technology is both an enabler and, and an end in itself. Okay? I think we're almost done. Finally, the value chain as we've come to, to, to understand it for, for, for media products. Essentially, 
now has three flowing areas. Enabling technology services, connectivity, and your user interfaces. So can you see, it's a completely different language that we're speaking here. It's no longer the idea of somebody comes up with an idea for a script, and the script is developed, they sell it to a producer. They, that very ecosystem, there's completely new terminology that we're using here. So I think that was my last slide. Can we just check one more? It might be... No, I think that was it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dimitri. It leaves us with a lot of information. I think what we're going to do is to go straight on to the panelists, unless someone has a burning desire to address something to Dimitri particularly. Okay, we'll disrupt. Do you have a... Uh, have a mic? So, up, you can have. But then we'll take the panelists one after each other, and then we'll have a general Q&A with everyone. Hello? Yeah, loud. So I've got a question about the research. Um, so I saw your breakdown, and I'm interested in what country we're modeling our migration into. And also, are we looking at Africa, um, Senegal, Nigeria, Kenya, I think Ghana, all have got better technology than we do. And regarding the, the data must fall, are we actually getting to government level regarding that? Because there are models in Africa that we can use to do that. So on the, on the data must fall, unfortunately, I'm not an expert on, on, on that area, but you are correct that the, uh, the technology does exist, for example, to zero rate. Um, and it's something that's very simple that a company could do, offer that, that data to, to its consumers. So uh, let's just say uh, Broadcaster X can say, if you're going to stream this program, uh, we, we, can, we can pay for the data, as it were. Um, in terms of the model that, we, that uh, we're following, uh, it's essentially it's a global agreement because the frequency spectrum um, is the same wherever we go. The airwaves are the airwaves, right? Now, we, uh, the world is split up into five different regions by a UN agency called the ITU. And they determine within each region what the rules are, how the spectrum will be used, and then each country is free within the, that sort of uh, model to decide we want to use um, spectrum in the 800 megahertz for Wi-Fi. Another country might want to use it for emergency communications. Or, so that, that is, is, is what is done on, on a local level. Now, that's from a technology point of view. From a, a content point of view, it's been really the Department of Communications and Arts and Culture, but we don't really have a strategy on digital, and that is something that, that they are busy working on at the moment. Okay. Sorry, and the question about um, the other African countries, are we using... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, so as far as I know, um, um, Mauritius and Rwanda were the first to, and, and Namibia, were the first to do their, their switch over. Um, but they've, they've uh, adopted the same technology, which is DVB. Um, so it's a standard, essentially, for your transmission equipment, for your reception equipment. And that, in a way, ha has been seen as a bit of a, um, a restriction or a constraint. Um, is that, was that along the lines that you were, were asking in terms of rest of Africa? No, Perhaps because we, we're something like fifth in terms of technological advancement, so we should be looking at Nigeria and Senegal and Kenya and Ghana. Are we looking at them? That's the question. Okay. I, I'm afraid we're not. I'm afraid the truth is we're following the... Thank you. We're now going to have the panelists up, and I'm going to invite Fados up first. Sure. And uh, I think the panelists are, are going to try to speak to 
what are the ways forward in terms of the disruption that we're facing and what in their particular lives are they doing? Okay, so I had a little video clip. I wonder if I can show that. It was Cry of Love. And I want to just say to you, that's our problem, disruption. We're not looking at ourselves and the continent. And it's exactly the way that we get sent to film festivals outside where money is spent in Europe and in the West, and we know that. And hopefully the summit will begin to change this. Um, is it possible? I'll probably just show a minute because I think I only have three minutes. Stand on the side. Johannesburg, city of gold, also known as Igoli, the richest metropolis in sub-Sahara Africa, a cultural hub and vibrant city with four million inhabitants. This is the city most Africans want to live in. Talent. Ubuntu. This is what we should be preaching. Say what you want to say. Be who you want to be. Do what you want to do. Everyone here is talking about Ubuntu. And yet I don't see these BEE types going back to the townships and giving back to the places that they come from. Say what you want to say. I'm the king of this place. Your own rightful hand. No one will come in here, not even the Messiah, and take the young kids off the streets and mess up my business infrastructure. No one. Who will you want to be now? Okay. You could just have the, you don't have to have the sound, sound but you could leave the pictures running. Um, I chose to use Cry of Love as an example of disruption. Basically what had happened was that Uncle Faith, well, most of you know Uncle Faith and I traveled around the continent and we were asked to do a Welcome series on violence my children. Uh, against children. It has and basically we went to different to parts of the world, uh, uh, different parts of the continent. Where in the, in Ethiopia it was marriage by abduction. Um, in Kenya we were looking at genital mutilation, female genital mutilation. In Mauritius, we were looking at child, um, just domestic violence. In Uganda, it was child soldiers. And so this all happened in 2001. In 2012, we decided that we needed to talk about these issues, but we needed to talk about it in an edutainment way, in a way in which it is palatable, that very difficult issues are discussed, but that we needed to communicate it to our peers. We needed to communicate it to children and to youth, and particularly um, to the powers that be. So how do we change the way that issues that are very close to our children, to our hearts, to our concerns, um, are being perpetuated, uh, perpetuated, and what UNICEF calls it is harmful traditional practices. So these are practices that happen, but they're harmful. So marriage by abduction, it is something that happens within a society, but it is, should not be happening. Um, so through edutainment, the idea was to use the model of fame, the musical, to have the elder group where you have Yvonne Chaka Chaka um, and uh, Lutuli Dlamini, who were the elders, and then all the actors, all these people had not actually performed on film before. They were artists, they were musicians, uh, they were dancers, and we brought them into a space and workshopped with them. And the stories that we had collated through these various travels across the continent were actually the text for the film itself. And what we had with that was an educational resource pack that had included in it different kinds of games that schools could use in a classroom. Um, there was different text, there was a way in which uh, we had a board game, a card game. 
So we were disrupting the normal way of storytelling. Normally, you produce the content, you show it as a broadcaster or filmmaker in a, in a television, on a television or in a cinema, and that was it. What we had done was to get it into schools, into community centers, into universities as part of the educational system so you had a resource pack and a film. And with the film, you could, it was uh, long enough because we were dealing with so many issues, it was two hours long. They could be done in separate vignettes. So you could have the vignette that talks about refugees or child soldiers. Um, there would be a board game with it. There would be uh, probably a text that the young people could read and deconstruct. And then there could be a conversation around it. Um, in this way, you could have it in a classroom as a subject for two hours or an hour or 40 minutes, depending on what the time was. But it also gave an opportunity to the young people to use arts and culture in a different way, in a, in a storytelling, taking really difficult stories and deconstructing it in a way that was palatable. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, um, there's one thing I'd just like to pass. It's because of disruption and innovation that we are exposed to the, to the information that we have. And in a lot of African countries, we know about the positions and the situations that are taking place, like the civil wars and the whatnots. If it wasn't for this disruption and innovation, I don't think we would be informed the way we are. And we're not, we're not crushing it. We, we appreciate the, 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 the position that it's putting us in, but we also debating in the long run, is this disruption and innovation going to work in our favor or not? So without wasting any further time, I'd, uh, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, which is... Uh, Nirvana Singh is going to stand in for Nomsa. Um, she's head of industry development at the SABC. Um, she obviously has not had much chance to um, prepare, but she does have a very po important portfolio in terms of youth development and industry development. Thank you, Nirvana, for agreeing. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, uh, Dimitri, actually, who's made my life very easy. Uh, I think what, when you talk about the SABC, um, we feel like we're the monster, by the way. And today was the day of that. Um, I would hope that you can see beyond that because Dimitri explained something very critical around the issue of what disruption means to the SABC. The SABC is a linear, analog, terrestrial broadcaster. And Dimitri explained exactly what that is. We broadcast uh, terrestrially over the top, we analog, we only have one way of uh, broadcasting the media, and we do not have, at this stage, digital access, because we have not migrated to the digital sphere, as uh, Dimitri explained. So SABC is stuck in a limbo, it's very important to note this. We are stuck in a limbo until the full digital migration uh, that is currently happening through the DOC. Um, they've actually done their first test case in the Northern Cape where they've, they've uh, switched to digital. So it'll be interesting to see how that digital migration will work. So it's very hard for us to talk about d disruption in that sense. We, we do not have um, the platforms and we will have the platforms, and that's what we call our DTT platforms. And in time, when those platforms are up and running, it will allow us to have multiple pl platforms for multiple types of content. Um, so you will not only just have SABC 1, 2, and 3 and SABC News, uh, you will have regional channels. You'll have channels specific for religion, for uh, uh, sport, for education, for news in the region. So that's, that's the big, big plan, and has been the plan since 2008, to 2000, 
2008, exactly. So it, it's been the plan for two, since 2008, and SABC has been trying to work towards uh, acquiring content to ensure that once those OTT channels are rare, up and running, there would be um, opportunity for producers, for the industry to uh, generate more content. Saying all of that, what, do we, what can we do right now? What are we doing as SABC right now in, in regards to the fact that things are changing? How content is produced is changing. How content is financed is changing. Um, we have few ways, not many ways, but one of the ways we have right now that I can talk about, which is part of the industry development, is around how we co-finance and how we share content with other platforms. So currently, we are just linear. So we are able to open the opportunity to co-finance projects that will allow pay TV and st uh, streamline, uh, st uh, streaming uh, networks like Netflix and Showmax uh, to share in the content with us. Because we don't need to utilize all of those platforms right now. What we require as SABC is to be able to uh, broadcast content on our channels. So therefore there's opportunity in terms of co-finance co uh, uh, projects that what we call windows that can be shared with pay TV and, um, uh, and the streaming services. So in that regard, we're trying to change the, uh, the financing models uh, of uh, content acquisition at the SABC. Um, the other things we, we, we've got is, we're talking about digital. SABC has now finally gone digital in terms of receiving content. Up until last year, we were still receiving content on tape. Um, we now, it's in line with the digital migration, and it's taken this uh, a long time to set up the systems and all, and put those things in place. But eff effectively, we're actually ready to go to, uh, digital because our di we now receive content on digital files. We've set up kiosks, we've set up processes. For those who saw us on the roadshow in November, we gave you the tech specs already. There, that's, again, something that we're trying to be bridging the gap before the digital uh, environment hits us. What else can we uh, share with you? In terms of industry development, which is a key area, for us as SABC, we want to be able to work with the youth, the women, people with disability around content, not only in Johannesburg, but in the regions. We are looking for content. We, I'm about to start a fire, uh, road show that I'm going around the country doing five minute pitches. And part of that is again, trying to find innovative ways to, uh, to access content, work with the, uh, with, with the industries. And the youth and the women and um, people of disability is critical for us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nirvana. That was very good coming right off the chair. Um, we'd now like to go to um, Isabel Rourke. Um, Isabel, come and enlighten us with poppies. <laughs> yeah. oh, no, you, don't. You, can do, you can sit down. Yeah. I wish this, uh, this podium was moved to the side. This, it's so disruptive. <laughs> Um, hi, everyone. Um, so essentially, you know, the animation industry really pretty much represents the ugly stepsister of our sector. We're always left out. I was added on last minute onto this, and I see we were not even included into the whole thing. Um, so as animation, we've always had to look after ourselves and make sure that we have, you know, strategies and plans in addressing some of the challenges that we are dealing with in our industry. So what I did in, at the last animation festival was really present, because um, I came onto the board of Animation SA to look at um, filling the transformation unit, which had never been filled because black people think white people are supposed to fill it and white people think black people are supposed to fill it. So it's just never been filled. And so one of the things I changed was the name that, you know, transformation is a given of what we're doing, but the key thing that we needed to change is that it's social impact and human capital innovation.
because that's where we're going. As animation, we, you know, when I speak animation, I'm talking VR, VFX, 3D, 2D, gaming. So it's a very broad area. And we're per permeating into pretty much every industry, every sector, um, not only in entertainment and media, but we're disrupting extremely in education. The education system is going to transform because of animation, gaming. Um, tablets are being rolled out into schools. Those textbooks need to be gamified and animated to make them palatable for children to be able to take in for this modern era in terms of where they're going. So, I mean, if you look at what's being done in Pretoria, right here, we're talking uh, uh, virtual reality animals that are dissected on your phone. So you literally just download the educational material and it's all in 3D and you're dissecting an animal. So no longer do you need to cut them up. They're all, even human, studying human, it's all in 3D and virtual reality. So the potential of where we can go with e-learning and you know, one of the things I did was bring gaming into because nobody was really looking after that gaming sector and going, the two are a great marriage and the one adds huge value to our animation um, value chain. Um, so yeah, I had to look at the entire value chain of the industry and look at, you know, because when you're trying to solve problems just in their little pockets, you really miss on a lot of stuff that are affecting it. So we had to look at the entire value chain from cradle to career, to grave actually, um, because it had to look into professional training as well. And we had to design interventions that address the challenges along that entire value chain. And this is what I've been looking at doing with um, for Animation SA. And so it's really um, pillared against a few key pillars. Um, four prong pillar on, 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 on two different areas. One is looking at schools programs, uh, post school, which is internships, uh, bursaries and internships, SMME hubs and clusters. So when we did research around the world, these are some of the latest kind of um, trends and developments that are taking place in some key countries around the world. And there's some really great examples of these and how they can work. Um, and then in innovating on our other areas is innovating on the development um, process in our, in our sector. Because animation is so expensive, you know, we've been looking at de-risking is a key component of what we have to innovate on. And we have to de-risk on multiple levels. We're talking de-risking in development, de-risking in finance, um, and de-risking on multiple levels. Um, so in looking at that, it was, for instance, um, development. How do we de-risk development? A big part of that is we have to bring the end of the value chain up front to the, to the, to the beginning because we cannot, as animation, go into production if we have not secured our licensing and merchandising deals, if we have not um, really gone into proper uh, visual development. Uh, Africanization of imagery in animation is a key component of how do we position ourselves internationally as a unique offering, not as trying to look like Hollywood or Europe or anyone else. Our best bet is to present our uniqueness and our Africanness is our, our unique uniqueness. So we're really working on multiple strategies that are preparing for the industrial, uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution in that there's gonna be huge demand for what we are, we have to offer. So we need masses of numbers of people for that. I mean, just to look at the e-learning and the education system and what is required there is, is massive, Never mind the entertainment and so forth. So hence starting ECD programs of introducing on those tablets that are being rolled out, software that kids can start to play with and our database of, of constituents going out to play with kids in schools. Um, looking at uh, uh, high school and junior school programs that start to work in townships that address the fact that art is being canceled in a lot of government schools. This is, is huge ramifications for our industry. Our animation schools are filled with like 75% white kids and model C kids. So it's only kids who have money, which means we cannot access rural and township kids because 
they don't get access to art classes and you cannot get into an animation school without art classes. So we have to put interventions in place that ensure that we are extracting those kinds of people because in, in looking at Africanization of imagery and animation, it is from the townships and the rural and people who are more connected to their culture that is going to keep that content authentic. So yeah, we are looking at multiple areas of, uh, of disruption. In finance, it's really looking at innovative finance vehicles. We, you know, starting to engage with SABC around, we know that you don't have money, we know you can't afford animation, we know you haven't been commissioning a lot from our industry for many years. As a result, you're selling toys for Disney. For everybody else that you're broadcasting, you're really selling their merchandising for them. So let's have a completely different discussion around how we can partner in the licensing and the merchandising of our content, since you cannot afford the, the, the actual content, let us source our own funding and you pay with the bulls, because you've got the biggest, you've got the biggest aud audience to our, our target market. Um, so really looking at how do we do things differently and engage differently and deal with the realities that are existing and designing our models to, to meet the circumstances that we're dealing with. Um, so I think that's my time. Thank you, Isabel, at Powerhouse as usual. I met her five years ago. She doesn't look a day different, so I wondered if you sent an avatar. <laughs> um, so can we have Dumi up next, please, from the Ergo company, the Therefore company? Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dumi Gumbi. I'm a film producer. Uh, I think about 2012, we made our first film, Gog Helen, for about half a million rands. It was really a, an experiment. We wanted to find out whether we could actually use local soap actors into local films and see whether it was actually going to make any difference or not. And I guess it's always, you guess, I guess you never really know whether you are innovating or disrupting anything when you're sitting in your little office and coming up with ideas, and coming up with different ways of actually trying to make films. Uh, and I think it was, I think the film was accepted to, uh, to, to DIFF, we were very excited about that. Went down to Durban, and then sh showcased the film, but then afterwards, I was very, I had a very sort of like, it was anticlimactic. So you've made this film, and then, so what's gonna happen to it? Uh, how do we continue to make films? Uh, especially knowing that like development funding is not really uh, it's not really available in South Africa so I think that's that was part of my sort of like disillusionment in terms of like okay, we've made this film people like it uh, is it gonna be released how is it gonna be released well a actually that film ended up not being released theatrically it ended up selling that film to to Mnet I think that one sale actually we actually made more money. We actually, we actually sold it for about $65,000 at that time. Don't know what the exchange rate was at that, but we actually broke even with just, just that one sale. But our, the biggest thing also was for us was like, we've made this Zulu film, but yet there are no cinemas in townships. And I think those are the things that we are facing as producers, as we continuously make, well, a lot of black producers are continually making films for black audiences. But every time we actually release a film, we're cutting out that entire township, uh, township market. So, like, so that, th those are the things that we were thinking about coming back from Durban. Uh, and so what we've tried to do, instead of like trying to get, to trying to get out of sort of like over-reliance on, uh, on government funding uh, in terms of like for development, and even for production, you know, I think we're still trying to, 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 to figure that out. How do we actually continuously innovate uh, without using, well, we like to call it the alphabet soup, right? So like we, we go to the DTR and the VF, and if those companies or if those organizations don't fund us, we're basically stuck in making, in how we actually go about making films. So in our company, we, we partner with various people within the industry. It's sort of like we still do apply to the, industry organization bodies, we don't really get anywhere with them. So we had to figure out a way of how do we actually continuously develop uh, projects. So we partner up with local writers, international writers now, 
Uh, and so, like, so that's, that's what we, like I said, it's very difficult when you're sitting in the office and you think I'm actually disrupting or innovating anything because you just kind of feel like I'm going to work, I have to figure it out as to, what I, as to how I'm going to try and make films. Uh, I'm being told I have one minute now, okay? Uh, so that's what, we, that's what we try to do. So from, from development to production uh, to finance, as well as what also now trying to get into distribution as well, we are bring, where we are bringing in international films into the South African market. I guess I'll end there. Uh, there is one or two things that we are picking up. There's one thing I need you to understand is that we come from different settings. And it might happen that with the, the panelists that we have here, not all of them you can understand them, but there might be that one panelist who talks to you. So hopefully you're going to use the opportunity when we are finished with the, 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 the disruption uh, discussion. To, to ask more questions, to, to, to have uh, whoever uh, talks to you make you understand more about uh, this disruption and innovation or anything that you might want to do with them in the future. But Ngalewaloko, Nguisera Gumama Kozang Seben Zingatwa to introduce Iskulum Setu Soktina. Thank you. Um, so next up we have, uh, I guess there's some of us that are cyberphobics and some of that are cybertopias. And I think um, you're probably on the Cypertobia level, which is that you're celebrating the arrival of Netflix, one of the big fangs. Um, and so let's hear from Kachiso Ladija and his new projects and how perhaps we can begin to work with the big monsters. <laughs> Cyperphobia and Cypertobia. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I have to, wow, five minutes. I, I also have to start by saying I really need to pee, so I'm going to take three of these, <laughs> and I'm going to use the rest to, so that you, I don't miss out on anything, so that two minutes, please grant me that to go to the loo. Um, I, yeah, I, I come from a company called Diprente Films. I prefer for it to just be called Diprente. It was registered as Diprente Films, but Diprente means the pictures, so when you add films, it's kind of a bit redundant. But the brand, it's the brand. They always call it the brand when you see it. Um, uh, I, we we work. We, we kind of we started a business with myself, a gentleman called Isaac Mohajani, and another gentleman called John Volmink. And we we I think the, the what we got. John Volmink passed away two years ago. But the benefit of those was we were kind of on, always fighting, and and uh, so the like for instance, John Volmink always wanted to do international kind of genre pictures. And I really hated that because I thought that was just a cop-out. You're going to get whatever. Van Damme over here. I always thought of them as B-grade when he said genre and so on and so forth. So eventually, what, what we ended up doing, what I kind of had to prove, like the both of them, and we always we ended up agreeing, was to make South African things for the whole world, you know, and I think then that became the innovation, I guess. I, I think everybody's trying to do that, but then we, we thought it was our, only, our own idea. We were originators of this. All creative, so the time or the money that we would have been asking from the NFVF or whoever, we kind of used it to say, okay, cool, we'll do it. I'll go to my house and write for free because then I don't have to ask for the money and then that doesn't mean using the time is money concept. And then, and so, so then that kind of started working because then what happened is we developed these things and then we go to markets around the world and then, like everybody does. I don't know what I'm saying as an innovator here. I'm saying everything that you all know. I'm just <laughs> reiterating. Um, and, and so, so then... So, so yeah, the, then I, what we discovered is that the, the whole thing was the, the more local you are. If you kind of, you, if you've got your, your audience as a global one, you, you can tell extremely local stories as long as you know that people will understand them wherever they, they land, you know. So versus you trying to make, I think what Isabel was saying, versus trying to say, this is what Americans want to see, uh, maybe start with this is what you want to see and then and then the, the more, then try to make sense of it. It's like maybe a, a, a skill that one learns from stand-up comedy because then you like get thrown into in front of a Canadian audience or an American audience and you can't, you have to tell your story and make sure that they understand and then I think in that skill you end up making things that 
are very original, uniquely from where you come from, but then they make sense and they're like, they're like sci-fi because you kind of build these worlds that people didn't know existed, but then they do. So it's like easy. Like, you know, when you watch sci-fi movies, you kind of go into these crazy worlds that are really well painted and detailed, but they don't exist. And whereas we have the benefit of things that do exist, we just have to tell them well and sell them to the world. So that was, I think that was the innovation, really, if you want to call it that. Um, uh, and then, um, uh, and yeah, so then uh, we, we do also animated stuff, and which was very expensive, as you say. The, the development of animation, very, very expensive. So having dipped our foot into that, and it's sort of working out, we, we also discovered, hey, if we're going to spend like a million bucks or a million and a half on developing something, what would happen if we took that and, do, and used it to produce stuff, you know? And, and like, like live action stuff. So we made a film called Matuetwe, where we spent about 600, 700,000 bucks in production but the whole thing of it was what is, what the exercise it's mostly experiment, the exercise was we've got a month, let's make a movie and what are the, you know, what you, let's use the parameters, so usually you'd kind of go, okay 700,000 rand let's shoot a movie in a house or let's make it set in a wedding and then it's at one location and this is your cast and with us we kind of went, okay let's make a movie that's set in one day, so the, the cast don't have to change costumes or anything and and we can shoot it over whatever, eight days, we only had eight days and then, and so we, yeah so we kind of went, okay, they're gonna, it's gonna happen over New Year's Eve and it's gonna be on one day in, in one day and then half the the movie is going to be narrated. There's going to be a bunch of narrators telling you the movie in a funky way that works because in the in those townships there's always guys who are telling you the story and let's use them as part of the story and that would take one day to shoot but it would it would it would kind of take up half the movie. And so and if that didn't work we were fucked. We would have a 45 minute movie that we would have to run around like trying to find funding for to finish and come up with a story. So so luckily that did that did work. So I, I mean I think ultimately what we do is take chances. It's like we all do. It's a gambling gig. I think those distributors will tell you now. I think they're the biggest gamblers. And it is that. It's it's a. I think as soon as we. I'm a content guy and I I kind of appreciate that there's all of these content buyers that are coming up in the world and I can continue with this gambling gig. And uh, yeah, that's it. I think that. Leaves me two minutes to go to the loo. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, you see, I want to bow it to Sis Pegulo and La Manga Muga before it to Mama Bobaba. Now, Wonku Munto Lainzini. So now it's that time where we start asking those questions and um, start writing your questions in about and Bangan, and then we we ask them. Thank you to our panelists for all their insights. Um, I think I just wanted to uh, do some practical questions right at the start. And I think one of them is, you know, for those you, uh, for those you talk about youth empowerment, but our youth are watching four screens. So what innovations do we know of in our country that are addressing four screens? How, how are we addressing that in our commissioning practices, in our funding? So that's the one question. Then I think um, perhaps the second question would be, if, we, if the priority is story, as we are seeing all over the world, that, and as Kahisa was talking about, like fundamentally get your story intrinsically right in your own country and it's likely to travel. If we are then going to compete on an international level and we see what, is be, what kinds of money, like three billion from Netflix, being put into storytelling, how do, say, commissioning practices at the SABC allow for those stories to compete on an international level? How can we look at commissioning differently? How can we look at funding differently that allows different kinds of stories? Um, you know, that, that the commissioning system is one for all, one fits everything. How do we throw that up a little? Um, and then I think maybe those, let's address those questions at the start, and then we take questions from the panel. I mean, from the floor. Do you want to start? Uh, I think. Okay. Um, thank you, Pat. I'll just start quickly to, I think what is important to note is as the public broadcaster, we have a mandate. And there will always be 
um, a commissioning process and a, a commissioning procedure that has to be followed. But what we also have um, in terms of trying to open up the space where we can um, co-fund, co, uh, co-finance projects, it's, it's in that space where there's the opportunity to, as the SABC as a broadcast platform, to support a project that has commercial viability and international legs that we can support, which allows the story, which as you know, SABC story is critical, it talks to the audience. So it allows both the SABC to get the story it needs, but also allows the world to, to hear local stories. Uh, which is supported by the SABC. I think that's one of the big things we're doing. I, I think we need to look at the shift. And I really think that there's a change in terms of the way that young people, and, and I think even older people, watch. Um, I've just doing, been doing some research, even about Netflix. You know, we, we're all excited about Netflix. It's streaming. It's subscription. Somebody's going to pay. We talk about data in this country. Data must fall. I don't know when young people or ourselves, you'd be able to even find the content that you're looking for on Netflix. So I think we need to begin to question that and disrupt that model. Um, we also need to look at what is African, what is South African. Why are we all jumping on the bandwagon of Netflix? Very exciting. They talk all this money that they're going to be throwing at you. The reality for people internationally is how do they find it? The Asians are not going to Netflix. They found their own model of a Netflix. So this is part of disruption. What worries me is as South Africans, we know we came in late in television, 75, 76, um, and we're still talking television. But the reality, I think, for the continent is television, unfortunately, because of data. If we had data, then we'd be doing what the Nigerians are doing. And you know what they do in Nigeria? They buy data for the equivalent of 100 rand. They start a YouTube channel that runs for a month. Then they buy another month's data and they continue the channel. They're not looking at the SABC or the broadcasters, even though they have 100 channels that talk to the language of their people. And I think part of our conversation, um, you know, we're part of the reference group and people were getting really upset with me because I said it's the same old, same old. And we sit and we talk the traditional format and the traditional way of storytelling. Part of what I did when I showed you, I mean, I'm showing you this little clip which we did in 2012. So we're now sitting in 2019. What are we doing? And I really do believe that the change will happen with young people. Um, for us as, as the older crowd, yes, I'll find my Netflix and I'll look at that particular, because Netflix, Netflix, and as somebody said, it's algor algorithms, right? So they identify you, they know what you want, and that's what they're going to push towards you. You're not going to find the innovation, the difference, the other content that other people are watching. It takes a long time for you to be able to do this. So I think a lot of this idea around innovation has to do with education, about access, about data, about streaming. None of this has even touched us, in our, unfortunately, in South Africa. So as much as you present, you know, the, the fourth revolution and where we're going to be, what is our reality? And how do we, within that reality, understand where content fits? And content, the story, is king. What uh, Lesejo is saying is nothing new. The, the Kajiso, sorry, my dear. Is we know that. You start with your own story. When you sit and your grandmother tells you your story, it is about your people. It is about who you are. It is not about those people on the other side of the world. But as South Africans, we think that we need to be telling the story that is sitting in Hollywood. We get onto a plane and we go to the Cannes Film Festival. We will not get onto the plane and go to Durban and build that sector that we should be doing. Yeah, I think, I think uh, the commissioning needs to completely change in this country. Um, I think there needs to be more co-co-productions and co-financing models. Uh, and I think 
once we start doing that, then we'll be start creating content that can actually travel. Because I think like what's happening now with the local broadcasters, uh, you guys have a mandate and the, the quality of the, um, no, no offense, but the quality of the work that's being produced is not really there for the export markets. So I think like there needs to be uh, a change in the way that content is actually uh, commissioned locally. Um, I, th I think that this um, issue of, of local story is obviously one of the most important things, but if we look at sort of examples internationally, even the big bundled companies, like something like Fox or Sony, or always find a local channel that they put into their bouquet. Because local is that important, and local does something different to those international platforms. And even though you have that, you know, uh, uh, the... Chinese example, and you have fangs on the on the more sort of Western American example. Maybe there is an, an, an African equivalent of that. But at the same time, I think what we need to be talking about is how is local story being funded, protected from Netflix, and how how is it, you know, the important thing is belonging, right? Belonging to local TV. It's a different thing from algorithmic um, commissioning on Netflix, we're always going to have commissioning editors on local programming, particularly on PBS stations. You'll have algorithms on, a on international platforms like Netflix. So um, maybe we should just open it up for discussion from the floor. Uh, hi, I'm Craig Kelly from uh, Africa XP. We are um, television content distributors and uh, theme channel creators. Um, I think the real revolution is digital distribution, really, at the end of the day. And when I say digital, I don't mean migration to DTT, <coughs> which I personally think is a waste of time, and, uh, and I'll explain why in a second, but um, internet distribution enables the producer to take the content to the public themselves without gatekeepers. And in that sense, it's a, it's a democratization <coughs> because it enables you to make decisions about what you think uh, will appeal to the audience and to be proven right or proven wrong. And particularly if you can make a film um, by self-funding it, um, then you, don't, you know if you make a movie for six hundred thousand bucks, you only need fifty thousand people to watch it for ten rand, and you're in profit already. Now, looking at the African market, there's there's really only one country that uh, has a, a really serious production industry of scale, in my opinion, and that's Nigeria. And the reason they have that market is because Producers self-fund, and when they've made something, they have a place where they can go and sell it, get money back, and make another movie, just like a farmer might take vegetables to a market. And we don't have a market at the moment, because you go and you make a movie, even if you self-fund it, and you take it to which broadcasters? They're, they're three. They probably don't want it. They have their own ideas. So the revolution is that we need to embrace the idea of the fact that we can and we must have uh, utilize the platforms and have platforms that enable us to take far more content to the market than we've ever taken before. That means using the internet, that means agitating for um, uh, data distribution to come right down uh, on a regulatory basis, but also for more, more Wi-Fi platforms and things like that to be built out at far lower cost. It means um, not, not pursuing this digital terrestrial idea where we'll only have three muxes. How many channels can you carry in three muxes? We should have 200 channels that are all full of the content of producers. Producers should be able to launch their own channels. 
without having to apply for a license and get behind the queue of 150 other people who are all better politically connected and they're putting in applications as well. It should be about having the content. If you have the content, you should be able to get it to the public and monetize it. So, so that to me is, is, is the disruption and, and satellite can do that. You know, Switzerland doesn't have DTT uh, because it, DTT can't carry enough channels and they have too many mountains and in Africa the population is too sparsely spread. So why do we even bother? We should have 300 channels on satellite tomorrow carrying the work that we can all produce and put on there. Okay, um, I don't know how to, how to put this, but the fact is we make content for people to consume. And in our country, in South Africa, um, SABC is the biggest place where people consume uh, the products we, um, we make. But SABC has itself to blame um, because Mzansi Magic was a big interrupter and they let it happen. <laughs> if they, I don't know how many producers I know who have gone to pitch at the SABC and said, oh, SABC rejected it, but I took it to Mzansi and they loved it. Um, and SABC keeps rejecting work that Mzansi Magic keeps taking. Imagine Isibaya on SABC One. Damn. That would be bigger than what it is right now. And as I hear, true or not, SABC rejected it. Iostele was rejected at the SABC. Um, Zanzi Magic has it now. So are the people within the SABC innovative enough to buy and take content? Yes, you guys have a mandate, but some of those shows fit into the mandate of giving people content where they see themselves in it, which is why they'll keep coming back and consume it. SABC right now has no drama that trends, Twitter speaks for nothing in terms of sales, but the Queen, the River, Generations, Uzalo, um, those, the, the numbers are simple, they're there. SABC should be controlling this industry, but it doesn't. They've turned people away who have gone to Mzansi Magic, regardless of the rights of the scripts and all those, there's too many issues within that. But they're taking their stuff back there because SABC keeps rejecting it. Is it because the people internally and innovative, or they don't view, I, I don't know what it is, why this project is being rejected by the SABC. Um, good day, my name is Pumay Langomane. I think my question is specifically to Gakhasol Ludicha because he ended up being on Netflix. So I wanted to find out how did his project, Catching Feelings, do on Netflix compared to ticket sales perhaps? And how does he feel being showcased on Netflix? And I know the sentiment in the room that we should um, create our own platforms, but there's already existing platforms. So I wanted to find out how has it worked for him. Okay, um, uh, the question: How how is the 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 ticket sales versus Netflix? The ticket sales were atrocious. Um, uh, it was, I mean, it was hard, but then the, we also kind of went, we got a bit overexcited because when we made that film, Catching Feelings, it was supposed to be a shop window and kind of do, you know, international sales, you know, whatever that meant. And then when it came close to releasing it, we got excited because Peltuzzi started trending and all of that. We forgot that it's not necessarily what we intended for the market. So I think the opening weekend was about 300,000 300, bucks, which was, it's sad. I mean, if you've been there on those Mondays, it's just one of the saddest things. Um, versus like catch, uh, the first weekend was almost a million bucks on 17 screens. So, 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 but then when it went to Netflix, which is the kind of platform that it was intended for, it did extremely well. And I mean, hence I'm in a relationship with Netflix. Um, uh, 
But so, so that, you know, that, but then I think, so that was it. And I think to speak to your thing about creating your own platforms, I, I also, I'm, I don't necessarily have an appetite for that because as a producer, uh, you, you're making, a film producer in South Africa, you're cutting trailers, you're making posters, you're doing this and that. So sometimes you just want to have a sexy time, you know? Um, and, and I imagine, like, if you're going to distribute your own content, it's just hard. It's just like one of those things. So, uh, you know, I think that I'm, I, for one, I think I've had that kind of trip and I want to get to the place where I just travel business class for a little bit. And then... Uh, and also now with the, with, the, with the SABC, I think also there was a time where the SABC was kind of like a revolutionary because it gave, it gave me a platform when apartheid ended and they were looking for people to make things, they chose me, you know. So, so, and it gave us an edge. There were crazy, Pio Monati show happened there, um, uh, Yuzo Yizo, all these crazy things happened there. And it was like really kind of the voice of the nation. But I think it's, I mean, thanks to whatever, mismanagement and all of that, they stopped managing the content, uh, market the concert because now I made a, a, a pretty cool show with Brahu and nobody saw it. People kept on asking me what I'm busy with. Hey, uwi, lelijicha, you know, <laughs> all the time. But at the same time, I had this like big show that they paid like lots of money for, but nobody knew about it. So I think that maybe that the problem there is that you are making these things, you have like the minds in there, you have all these producers making things, sell them. You know, I think just get get the act together, and then we shall we shall overcome. But we're to be Sunday as a single lashel and embossed. So, Mama, are you ready? Yes. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> I have my colleague from drama here who's just arrived as well. So, uh, you know, it's not an easy question that I can answer with easy. Uh, with, you know, we have a process. I used to work with my colleague over there at Imzanzi Magic, we were the first of the first of Imzanzi Magic. And we set the tone, we know what we did. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, I, it's not a fair thing. I think what you need to do as an industry is not use in, uh, Imzanzi Magic and SABC in the same voice. Because it says Imzanzi Magic has a very different mandate to a d very different audience. Um, we can talk more of that in detail, and I'm sure uh, the Mnet person, uh, Renilwe, could tell you more about their mandate. But the SABC mandate is different, and we not compare. You cannot compare the two. So I understand what you say. You you say there has not been good TV in SABC. Um, the audience still still tells us that we're making watchable TV. We still have the uh, we still have the numbers at 10 million of uh, Uz Uzalo, you know uh, that's our reality. Um, our drama series are still uh, or the most watched. Our reality shows. So yes, I take your point about the issues around content and the kinds of content, and that's something that as we evolve as SABC, we will hope to work on it. I think we must also be careful of how we just say things. So for example, Mzanzi Magic, and you can correct me, um, but when they started, I remember they were giving 100,000 rand to young people to go out, or old people, but for black people to make content. And then they were giving 2 million rand to Afrikaans speaking content. And so you have this wide you know, space of a big mess, quite frankly. So we need to also put things in context. I think the story you're talking about, if, we, if it was that easy for each of us to have our own broadcaster and go online, we'd not be sitting here today. I'd be having a channel, you'd be having a channel, we'll all be Oprah right now giving it out to everybody. It's not possible. It, has, it will not happen in that way. So we need to put things into context and don't just, you know, blah, blah. The fact that you have 100,000 rand and that is what Mzanzi Magic, that is what we have. What do we have? Really bad television, really bad stories. We have in township stories about people, Skopskit and Donner, and I'm not sure whether we want to be showing that all the time. And then we have high quality Afrikaans films because they were given different budgets. So this needs to be part of the conversation if we want to talk disruption. 
So, I mean, MultiChoice is, is a big organization. There's Mzanzi, there's CakeNet, there are various places that money is put. I mean, uh, CakeNet has so much advertising spend on it that it's a really lucrative market to, to put money into content. But I did hear that point, though, that I think SABC sometimes is its worst enemy because really I think the success of Mzanzi, not all the mostly lifestyle shows, but much of that success was due to our failure, SABC's failure, I think. And now you're seeing uh, multi-choice go ahead with local content initiatives. And I think that's also a gap in the present um, paralysis of SABC that, you know, we stopped being competitive in the public broadcaster because of all the paralysis that, that happened. And we miss opportunities. And what we don't want to miss is the opportunity with this huge youth bulge to make television that's on four screens that... Exactly. So, can we go back to the floor? Oh. Um, before we, we, we get back to the floor, one thing I would like to say is that um, as filmmakers, we've been, we've been surviving for the longest time. And yes, we might have SAPC in trouble and Mzansi Magic taking over. But I think at the end of the day, it also comes back to us as filmmakers appreciating the small things that SAPC has done over the years. If it wasn't for SAPC, I don't think Mr. Leticha would have been here today. And those are successes that we need to be celebrating, you understand. But go, going forward, what we should be doing is, yes, SAPC is in trouble. What do we then do now? And we need to create more platforms. For example, ma, I'm giving you a task. Right now, we're at a situation where the national broadcaster, so they call it national broadcaster or public broadcaster, only broadcast a few shows with different genres. We don't have a platform for filmmakers. You have filmmakers here. We, you don't broadcast their, 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 their content. We don't have platform for reality shows. We don't have platform for different types of shows, which is what Tina, as, as, as the people that are sitting in this room, as disruptors, we need to, we must capture that lady. We've been capturing everything. We must capture this lady. When she goes back to SAPC, we need to be create, we need to be creating new innovative ways of saving the national broadcaster and saving ourselves in the process. So I'm going back to the questions. Okay, let's open it up again. And Nirvana, thanks so much for standing in. And we know that you, your portfolio is really about industry growth. Thank you. Um, anyone else with um, Leboni? Why don't we kick off with you? Kick on. No, after this young man, he's on. Oh, okay. Sure. Sorry, you've been waiting. <laughs> All right. Okay, no, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Tando Bam, and uh, as you will know, one of the hats that I wear is that of a, of a poet. And now, poets worry a lot. <laughs> I worry too, you know? And. Uh, there's this uh, sexy term that is being used a lot in that is in, on people's lips and that is the fourth industrial revolution. And the fourth industrial revolution to me is disruptive. You know, the digital medium is very much disruptive. So in the South African context, uh, are we ready for the fourth industrial revolution should we be something that we get excited on based on the social and economic landscape you know and are we saying that artists should be more entrepreneurial rather compared to creating a much more healthier environment for them thank you very much thank you um Lebonne? okay um Okay. I wanted to contribute uh, at the point where you stand. I wanted to contribute at the point when you were making the comparison between Mzansi Magic and uh, SABC in particular, but I've just had the pleasure of being able to walk into every single one of the commissions. And it's very strange how when you speak about disruption or innovation, you speak about Mzansi Magic. Like everywhere. I think we need to dispel this myth, right? It was not anybody's innovation. It was something that was bound to happen, but some guy that had enough financial resources to be able to identify a commercial opportunity 
took advantage of indigenous knowledge that our mothers had paid for for years. So we don't even own our innovation. We were the innovators. The Vodacom case is a case in point. Intellectual property, I was embarrassed this morning on behalf of Mnet to see Rinelwe, you know, protect a regime that is part of NASPERS. They are able to innovate. Disruption is about the ability to be able to move to that point and to be able to benefit from that disruption. It was fascinating to listen to Professor Marwala this morning talk about how he owns his intellectual property and the processes that he has to go through to own that. But because our industry is still not transformed to the point where we even have the opportunity to own our ideas, we have to go and farm out our ideas and give them to somebody else for peanuts. Innovation and disruption in itself still becomes, and I think I'm borrowing from what Professor Marala was saying, it becomes something that is going to disadvantage us forever. So my question is, where are the black cores better, right? They are the ones that are supposed to facilitate our disruption and innovation. And until that happens, we are too damaged as film producers right now to be able to even trust each other, to be able to invest in each other. So we need black courses. We need the Patrices to allow that innovation to happen. Innovation without any investment in it is like me doing a skorogoroka in the township and not knowing what to do with it. But I, yeah, I don't want to go like Ahuso spoke about where we started out, right, with Pio Monati Show. Like literally, I will give you a perfect example of innovation. We it tried to innovate with the contracts at SABC with Pio Monati. He'll tell you the story. I walked out and I said, I'm not going to be the executive producer on Pio Monati the day that they signed the contract. Four years later, they could not make any movies, shows, dramas, because SABC would not give them the rights. That's why there's no other Pio Monati today. But Pio Monati was the most innovative thing we ever did. We were, we were your age, my brother. We were having the best fun. We didn't care. Up to today, trying to access our original innovation is still locked in those kinds of contracts without contributing too much. All that I'm saying is that the reason why we are hosting this particular summit is to be able to say, and I think it was said earlier on, that the biggest investor in our industry at the moment is government. That's wrong. That has to change, right? We can't be dependent on government forever. We can't be saying we want to innovate. We know government has its own challenges. So I'm throwing the ball to, I think, the audience to say, the time for us to be able to invest in our own innovation is now. Like, we can't even depend on, on government anymore, but it does need that kind of financial investment. Sorry, that's my small contribution. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Evelyn Maruping. Um, I'm from Kimberley, and um, somebody joked with me, the lady, she left here last night. She said, you are the industry in Kimberley. Um, so... In 2017, I left Joburg um, because I was very worried about the Northern Cape. Because whatever you see on television, the Northern Cape is never included. So I was like, I'm going to leave the industry. I will go back to Kimberley and see what I can do. And somebody offered to pay me 5,000 Rand to stay in Joburg. And I said, no, I have a vision for the Northern Cape. And I'm very happy to say I have people like Mr. Maema, who was assisting me with, you know, advice on how to position um, the, broad, the production company that I started in the province um, with the advice and stuff. Um, last year, I launched an online magazine channel. I know this is a film summit, but I think this is also very relevant because we're talking about transformation and innovation and disrupting um, the industry and stuff. Um, so what I did is I started an online a magazine channel, so we produce like online content and we're currently just trial running it on Facebook. And like somebody said earlier on, take the content to the public. So that's what we do in Kimberley. And someone else said people love seeing themselves on TV or on a screen. And the response from the Northern Cape is, I, it's amazing. Um, but my question is, if someone like me 
um, in the Northern Cape comes up with this innovative, which I, I believe it's innovative, um, idea to just start producing your own content um, without funding and you have presenters and you have staff members who come every single day to work with you on this big vision. What kind of partnerships exist um, between, for example, let's just say the SABC or MNET or whoever in mainstream, because my vision was to make the Northern Cape's content part of mainstream. Even if I have to do this, this little that I can do, how can I do that? What kind of partnerships exist? Or oh, is it even possible to partner with mainstream? Um, there was one more person over there, and then let's go back to the panel. Good afternoon, my name's Mvelisi. Um, I'd like to clarify uh, with the SABC how they can say that they are purely an analog distributor when they are sharing content on YouTube, freely accessible, and producers aren't receiving remuneration for that content which is freely accessible to anyone. Uh, we will take more questions. Thank you very much for, protection, for, for protecting me, Program Director. My name is Dima Gazorkocha. I represent the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa, ICASA. Basically, I just want to give my two cents worth to say that, you know, in as much as Television is still, you know, one of the most prevalent modes of, of communication through which people get entertainment, education, and so forth, mainly because of the nature of, of, of the South African market. But it's no doubt that the disruption is here to, to come and, you know, take what the, the traditional broadcasters are doing. But I just want to also highlight that in, in the broadcasting space, with the DTT that um, Mr. Martinez has been speaking about, there's going, we're going to be moving into a multi-channel environment, and I can guarantee you there will be a tremendous need for digital content. So I see that then being an opportunity for... Just by some because I take it that people cannot hear what you're saying. Just going on about where to... Hey, hey. Hey, it's all that side. Hey, hey. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you very much. So I was saying that as we move to the digital environment, obviously with the three maxes and the other maxes that uh, we're going to be releasing as the authority, there's then going to be a need for digital content, not just digital content, but original South African content. So I see then that as being an opportunity for the producers in the house, and even for, for the up young and upcomers, because then there's going to be a need for, for, these, uh, contents to, for, for, for these channels to be filled up with, with content. So I thought I should just highlight that, bearing in mind that um, we are still going to be migrating, but yet again, there are new channels, television channels that are, be, that are going to be licensed by the authority, which will then yet again create another opportunity uh, for production of content. Thank you. Okay, Bagwetu, um, I would humbly request that we give it to the, uh, the panel just to and then we'll have another last round of questions. I'm just going to take six people after, after uh, a panelistic deal and then so that probably Nirvana, you'd be best able to speak to the Northern Cape issue. Okay, and then Dimitri, you wanted to tackle one. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think um, thanks. Uh, uh, Dimakatsu for the last uh, uh, input because I think there has also been um, a little bit of, or, or let's say there hasn't been enough information given about what the plans are for this new digital uh, terrestrial platform that's going to be launched. Um, so somebody mentioned, uh, I think the gentleman at the back, that there will only be three multiplex. So a multiplex essentially is, is 
um, a piece of equipment that, that aggregates channels. It puts channels together into a bouquet, uh, sends them up to a satellite and then feeds a terrestrial uh, or in the satellite network. So one multiplex um, can, can uh, accommodate approximately eight to 10 standard definition channels. Um, and obviously the minute you're going HD, it's, it, it's a lot less. But um, there, there's a thing called statistical multiplexing. So these things are not very, it's not a rigid thing. The point I wanted to make is, and indeed uh, Dimakatsu raised it, there is gonna be a demand for content. And as content producers, you know that the lead up, so don't wait for that commission. Start the, start the process early. Um, and there won't only be three muxes, there are actually gonna be nine multiplexes. The other, the three are gonna be national, which means you'll be able to, there'll be, let's say up to 50, 60 channels for free. But then you get regional multiplexes, so you'll have, for, uh, it'll cover a city, for example, and there you'll be able to, to put in another 20 channels. Um, and so, um, so the idea is, yes, digital is coming, maybe not fast enough, but when we start talking about what can government do, where should we be directing resources now, we need infrastructure. And infrastructure in the, in the digital economy is not roads and dams. Infrastructure is data centers, data centers, studios, and high-speed connectivity. That's the infrastructure that we need government to invest in. Not just Department of Arts and Culture, not just DOC, whole of government. Thank you. Um, young lady from the Northern Cape, Evelyn, right? You have about, I had four other producers, so you, you, you're the fifth one, so you're not alone in there. So we were in Northern Cape in November, so it's a shame that you didn't make it, uh, but we are eager to work with, with producers, especially in the regions, especially in Northern Cape, support whether it's development, training, all that kind of stuff, so please um, connect with me. Okay, and then the young man asked about the YouTube. Yes, uh, SABC is in the process of developing a YouTube channel with its own content, so you will see some of its own uh, own content on on it. Um, with regards to SABC, hundred uh, percent own content. If it is rebroadcast in any form, uh, royalties are paid to the act uh, to the lead actors i think that's about yeah to the lead actors so if there is something happening they will get paid and the writers sorry uh, the writers and the lead actors they get a, a royalties on them okay we're going to go back to the audience there were more people in the room mickey you had your hand up originally um anyone else Okay, well, this is just... Okay, Mickey, and then the person behind, and then you. Three. Okay. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you'll be able to forgive me um, that um, I'm finding that the weight of the uh, discussion is too heavily um, focused, I think, in the now. And, and my understanding of this whole summit and obviously this commission was to look at, you know, what is five years from now, what is this world, this, this 4.0 uh, of the fourth industrial revolution, what is it going to look like? And obviously, 10 years from now, what is it going to look like so that we're not caught napping? Professor Morali was talking about us being 60 years behind. And I'm a bit worried that so far, we've really spent time talking about now. Matters of SABC, and, and, I, and it, it's real issues. I'm not, that's why I'm saying I hope you'll forgive me. It's real issues, but I, I, I'm asking myself, 
you know, what are we going to contribute to the overall discussion of the movement forward? And it, it, in a time, in a way, where a, uh, as Uzisi was saying from Mikasa, things are going to change whether we like it or not. Uh, the infrastructure that uh, uh, what anyone was talking about has to happen for us to begin to be in charge of, of our storytelling because in the end, if all we're going to do is create content, but in fact somebody, we leave it up to somebody else to transmit it, to show it to anybody else, to control its delivery, in a sense we're back to square one. And, and for me, I see us finding ways, I mean this whole idea of the Fortin Darsa revolution as being, being controlled by the concept of convergence means that filmmakers are going to come together into a room, into a space with uh, CSIR, with Telcom, with Department of Science and Technology, with DOC. Um, uh, I mean, television as we know it, in fact, it won't be even be called television anymore, right? So it, it's almost like a new terminology, a new language, a new business model completely, right? Uh, the idea that people who create algorithms, uh, people who, who will be creating digital models, all will have to be in the same space where they will all access almost like the same library, if one can put it that way. And in, that's the future of, of filmmaking. That's the future of you know, uh, uh, the audiovisual industry. And, and, and for me, I, I, I don't know if there's a way in which we can shift the gear to go in the direction of, of because this, what we're talking about, the content will be part of that as, uh, as, as well, because the, the artist, the creator is not gonna be got rid of. It's always gonna exist. But how do we ensure that they are protected by the infrastructure, they are protected by policy that will have to be created, the technology, uh, people who create algorithms to be able to capture the and the, and the, and whatever, right? That's all part of who we are. That's part of the identity of who we are. So I, I mean, for me, this is this is what I think will move us forward more. And I don't know if there's a way to shift the discussion in that direction. I think it's been a, a pretty mixed conversation between things that we have to do in order to get ahead. Um, and I think we sort of caught between the third and the fourth industrial revolution. And I don't think we're 60 years behind on this one. That was on the steam engine. <laughs> so, so I think, um, you know, even in the discussion of commissioning models and four screens, there's, we have to shift commissioning processes to allow for the u utilization of how people are viewing things in this disruption, disruptive era. When we talk about Netflix fangs and bats coming into the country, we have to talk about how does the local story um, how does local story survive and how does it survive? So I, I do think that we are addressing those things, but we are also stuck in a paradigm where we feel that our institutions have to move with us. I think the other big stick is DTT, you know, not being out, uh, laying out. And then on top of that, the digital divide where people don't have access to data. So those are all true to allow for the content to grow. But I... Fourth Industrial Revolution is solved. So yeah. we won't talk of issues of, you know, having to buy big data and so on, because we, it will all be under one family. You know what I mean? Because yeah. that's the fuel of the future. That's the oil of the future is the big data thing. Telcom becomes a player into that, right? And we did actually um, invite Telcom and we invited the networks, actually, because we wanted to have that conversation. So I think, Mickey, one of the things to put on our... Um, resolutions is to have that forum where we're bringing creators and big data networks into the same room saying what are we doing about creating that hub to make content. So I think that that is why we're here. Put the resolution on the table. Um, then... Right, okay. um, how are you guys? Uh, my name is Colbert. I'm a filmmaker. 
I'm just going to speak in terms of um, on the disruption issue that we're losing gems because you find uh, the government and your NFVF institutions, they put money out for marginalized kids from um, KwaZulu-Natal, Limpopo to come and study film. But we're losing those gems, those talented filmmakers because the funding is only to cater for them to study. The moment when they graduate and have the certificate, not most of them are integrated into the mainstream industry. And there are no structures in place to bring in a new way of thinking, because some of them, they're quite talented and they come with a new way of thinking. But the problem is that we stuck with um, the old guard who have the ways of doing which they're not allowing um, young blood in to to come up with and experiment and take risks in terms of projects. Like someone was referencing Izo Izo. At that time, it was the youth who came with a new way of thinking and putting that on, on TV. At the moment, there's this stagnation because the people in the key positions, they're not allowing in for, for young blood. And I feel gatekeeping is another issue that's also stopping the, or bringing in the disruption element. Okay, um, I think we, we're gonna, we, we had two hands. Oh, it's three. Oh, okay, it's now four. This is the last four, and then um, we're gonna take it back to the panelist. Okay, thank you so much. My name is Johnny. I'm from the Pan African Chamber of Commerce. Um, I just wanna ask a question. I think we know that creativity is the currency in the fourth industrial revolution and we're here talking to creatives so there's no there's no problem basically talking to creatives but how then do we collectively work together to empower creatives to acquire the skills because when we're talking about the future of work when we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution you need a certain set of skills so it's not just actually everyone who is going to be thriving within that space how do we work collaboratively, every single one of us, the government, the private sector, creatives themselves, to help them acquire the skills that can allow them to thrive in the world that is driven, as we know now, by technology and, and innovation? And whose job actually is it to empower them? I remember hearing a cabinet minister here in the Republic of South Africa saying that we don't need the fourth industrial revolution as long as our people don't have water, they don't have, whether you like it or not, it's already here. How then do we drive innovation, giving innovation um, intervention actually to, 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 to government intervention? I want to know the responsibility to empower these creatives to acquire the skills to compete in this world that is driven by innovation and technology. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nadine, I'm a filmmaker. Um, yeah, I'm very interested in how we get our black audiences to more support our work like you were speaking on. Because um, I did a film that, you know, concentrated on a local struggle, you know, from Pontyville, for example. So at the moment, I'm in the middle of negotiating still for a distribution deal two years later. But the community have taken kind of ownership of that film, right? So what we started doing last year was having home screenings in Bonteville. And just to mention two that, were, that kind of stood out for me, it was a woman that decided she wanted to screen the film to only working, well, everyone's a working class in Bonteville, but to working class mothers. So we had the screening of under 20 working class mothers in a room watching a film and we could have certain conversations afterwards. And in another, so they have um, street committees in Bonteville and then the street committee wanted to play the film as part of the protest. So we screened it at the back of someone's wall, we put it up. But now, <clears throat> that's all good and well and obviously I'm doing that, I'm not, I can't charge for that kind of thing, right? But so the question is how do we um, motivate those kind. We want, we want our communities to take charge of our work like that, but how do we monetize it then at the same time? So looking at kind of, yeah, distribution. And because, I mean, we can speak about the digital revolution and that's amazing, but the data thing is going to remain a problem and who can watch a 90-minute film, for example, you know, online. So 
yeah, that's my interest, you know, how do we do that kind of thing and monetize it? You know, can we go to NVF and say, hey, I want to do 50 home screenings in the township like that, you know, can we look at different modes of distribution on that kind of platform? Uh, thank you. Good afternoon to everyone in the panel. Yeah, my name is Shumi the Poet. Um, I'm an artist. My real name is Ndota. Shumi is the stage name. I just have a few questions uh, that I want to shoot to the panel. I don't know which one will correctly answer me. Uh, but I'm concerned about since they're talking about innovation, how did you take a step in terms of making an outreach of innovating young people in the ghetto who are doing real stories? Because to be honest, um, Mzansi Magic is broadcasting the real stories regardless of the content or the quality that they're producing, but the quality of the story that they're showcasing there is our story. And how do you make an outreach program where you go to this ghetto? Because we have sessions of poetry where we, we, we don't have a market in SABC to, to, to showcase our, our, our craft, and we are a creative sector that always have uh, documented videos and as, as you know that there is a huge event that takes place in Deben. Uh, it calls Africa Poetry where they call different powers from even different uh, uh, neighboring countries to come and make sure that poetry takes place. But we don't see uh, the innovation of SABC taking part in that to make sure that also it creates a market for the creative writers who are poets who, who are taken uh, not into consideration in the film industry because we see instances where poets is just no Lebu Mashil and Zwakembul. How about the ones that are coming underground that are not exposed because they're not even getting a market to expose their craft? And my, my, my also question is that on the terms of streaming line and the downloads, how to protect our craft? As I'm saying now, I have a, I have a stream video. I have videos that are uploaded on, 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 on internet. We call it online TV that we've created. Uh, the web is just, you just write a why not now dot TV. We say why they're not broadcasting, why they're not broadcasting our craft as poet now. Just what we create, we say why not now dot TV. When you go there, you see Shumi the poet speaking about the African content and the story of Abangoma and the story that is misled told in the media. Uh, so we want to know how are you going to uh, empower those young people and make sure that they also get an exposure in, 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 in SAPC and tell us the know-how and the requirements and T's and C's for us to apply and make sure that our craft continue to be there because we see a gap even about the comedians. It's only few who get the spot, but this market is rising and it seems like it's not getting exposure. Thank you. To take the questions that you've been asking, uh, I want to make a, a request. As young people, we live in a country where we don't have mentors. And as a result of us not having mentors, this is why we are at the position that we are at, where you find young people exploiting and taking advantage of this disruption using their camera phones and anything that is, 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 is ex exposed to them to tell stories. Up until we have our elders learn to account for their mistakes. And they also, above women and Oguti, what had happened to them in the past had, had heavily affected them. Then, I guess this is a pump it. We can, let's, let's talk about what's going to happen in the future. But the, the problem is that if we talk about what ha, what's going to happen in the future, we'll be leaving something behind. Things that need to be addressed. And this is the time for us to be addressing matters that our parents failed to address back in the past. So, Minister Losamsi Soto, as filmmakers, as young filmmakers, we need you to pass the, to pass the torch. But for you to pass that torch, you need to go back in time and tell us, Kuti, what your industry looked like. And the innovative and, 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 and the, the, the first or the second and the, or, and the third industrial revolution looked like in the, uh, for, for you at the time. In order for us to fully expropriate this fourth industrial revolution, give us our history. So, Angfunuk Moshis Kati, Nizola Shalum Popongale, Ngoba Minangkulma Ngesizul Bafuetu. Oh, yes, so Bonapambi. 
Obano funu kala bazal bam. Because I, yeah. Um, uh, I, I think that there's, there's great talk about this industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, the digital, digital revolution. But, but the, I mean, it's a two-edged kind of sword because on the one side, it means that we're all going to be thrown into the superhighway, right? We're in a world where like Game of Thrones has been, has been downloaded illegally 14.7 billion times. So that means 14.7 billion times it was watched for free. Can you think for free compete with a $10 million per episode thing? So that kind of, if we had to make Game of Thrones into Sepedi mixed with Afrikaans, mixed with Zulu and put it on SABC, would generations be able to compete with that? You know, and, and the, the fact, another fact is like Netflix coming here, they are, they've spoken to Treasury, they're speaking to all our telecommunications companies, they are seriously coming to make local content for the world. So, you know, I heard like multi-choice is with their listing price, they're expecting to raise about 70 five billion rand netflix is spending 12 billion dollars on content just content not for management costs you know so so it's it's like what are we going to do i don't know if the broadcasters if it's the finances but we need to kind of think if we're going to sell our culture because by selling these stories and our cultures it means we can sell our clothes we can sell our shoes we can sell our tourism and all of that crap so we we're pretty screwed uh, so i think we need to start thinking less in a grassroots way and more in a how do we sell save ourselves, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, for me, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, the real core of it is people. It's about education. It's about preparing people for what's coming. And there's job losses that are coming, but there's going to be massive new innovative jobs that are coming. And how do we prepare people for that? In my industry alone, there's massive changes that are taking place that require people to be trained for that. So the core training for me is entrepreneurship, business. We need to understand the business of what we are doing and innovation. We need to train people about what is innovation. How do you think innovatively? How do you run your company with innovation as a core value within your business so that it is part of your operating systems? Um, then to answer Bonteville, sorry, I forgot your name. <laughs> Nadine. Um, to give you a couple of examples from the past, um, there's, there was a, an organization called the Film Resource Unit that used to do uh, township screenings. And they just took a bucky with a screen at the back and went from township to township, screening different films and then selling the, the DVDs there. This was done in the US in the 60s with some of the big studios that currently are massive today. They would go into the small towns. We ignore the small towns when they are the most hungriest for content and we are not getting to them. So we need to find innovative solutions of how do we get to those people. And once we, I mean, the, the, in the USA in the 60s, they would make sure, they would send troops out into these little towns and ensure the community newspapers and the community radio stations were flooded with the fact that this is coming. They built big hype. Send your stars into those townships and let them lay the groundwork for the income that their, their films must generate. So really looking at, you know, what are some of the successes of the past that we can replicate and, and put into place? Um, also, film resource units used to sell a lot to the universities around the world. Now that that's not existing, where do they buy? Where do universities order our content? It was a major sales point. Um, so yeah, just in terms of um, going back to the fourth industrial revolution, it is really about educating our people on innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, Isabella, actually while you were talking earlier, um, I really wanted to ask you the question, why, are, why isn't a school subject writing code or, you know, kids having the history of technology and latest technology and being able to experience AR or artificial intelligence and being able to, because how do you imagine it without knowing where it's at at the moment, how you can develop on it? So why isn't there a mass campaign for that to be in schools? I mean, there's no, there's no subject that says media as a subject, and we're in another world. 
Well, these are some of the key issues that we're looking at animation because, you know, the impact on the jobs that we need, that we look at what we're preparing for, we have to start going into the schools. We have to start preparing our students. So this is why, you know, as an organization, we're looking at how do we start to lay those, those, those seeds. You know, my kids are now being offered coding in, in pre-primary. And, yeah, I started having kids late. <laughs> And, but this is for people with money, you know, for township kids. How do they get access to these kinds of things? And this is where government has to start gearing young children for the future that they will be entering in when they come out as adults. So the, the education system needs a massive overhaul. And this is where uh, VR, VFX, animation, gamification is gonna come in, in changing those textbooks to be updated but you know, trying to change the education department, that is another archaic kind of beast because it's academics. And academics are the most rigid and difficult to get to shift. So we've got a huge like cha challenge on our hands. So it then becomes really key that we look within our sphere of influence what impact can we make within that, within our industry organizations? What strategies can we use to start making inroads within the areas that we need to extract value from? So I want to uh, read a quote here, which, oops, sounds really interesting. Uh, we see a country that has embraced the benefits of technology for economic growth, social development, and for effective governance. We are producers of knowledge and drivers of technological progress. This is our president, current president, Cyril Ramaphosa. This is part of the ANC's manifesto in terms of innovation and what they intend doing. So I think when we ask the questions, Brameki, about what, where are we at, the ANC seems to have prepared a document. And if we as delegates here can also challenge them as government in what is written on paper and what actually happens, there is also the challenge to ICASA in terms of the cost of data and that that needs to fall. So I think when you say, you know, where are we, what are we talking about now when we should be thinking about you know, five years time, our reality is now. And now, unfortunately, is where we were when we discussed this 25 years ago. 25 years ago, we were them, fighting the system, asking for the very same things they are asking 25 years later. The cost per minute from SABC has not changed. We are still paying the same, they are still paying the same amount the cost per minute to produce. And if it is slightly more, if you went from 3,000 rand a minute to 5,000 rand a minute to 6,000 rand a minute, think about that, what that means in your current state of what the rand value is. So part of the challenge is, yes, we'd like to talk about leapfrogging and saying where we would be in five or 10 years. The fact that Evelyn has to go back to the Northern Cape and start something because there is nothing there. When you ask me what is our history, in 1995, so we're talking 1994, New Democracy, 95, we went to the first World Summit on Media for Children in Australia. In 1995, we created the Africa Charter on Children's Broadcasting. In 1996, that charter became the guidelines for content production for South Africa, for Africa, and the Commonwealth Broadcasting Association. In South Africa, if I talk to producers, they do not know that there is a charter on children's broadcasting. They do not know ch the charter, which I, I, I say off by heart every time I'm in a space, is Article 4 says children should hear, see, and express themselves, their languages, and their life's experiences through the electronic media that reaffirms their sense of self, community, and place. And at that time, we were coming out of apartheid, where on television, our children were watching content that was basically in English and Afrikaans, and they were seeing children who were happy, living in wonderful homes, you know, the picket fence kind of situation. We did not see rural children, we did not see black children, we did not hear 11 languages. 
I don't know how much we have moved from where we were in 95. In 96, this chart is adopted. Today, if I ask people, they don't know that. Where did, where did the content, where did the regulation come from? That process. I went to every single, in 1993, we only had four provinces. I traveled the length and breadth of this country to every single province to get children on children's rights before we could even talk about children's media rights. So what are your rights? We still have children falling in pit toilets. That is our reality in this country 25 years later. So we can talk and we must talk about what the fourth industrial revolution is. And we must understand, we're talking about the steam train, we're talking about electricity, we're talking about digital. That is what we're going, it's the technology that moves us on. The content remains, as we say, king or queen, depending where you sit. And how do you take that content, whether you take it to Facebook or someone takes it to Netflix or somebody else brings it to the SABC? How is that content relevant to its audience? Have we grown audiences in this country? No. In 1994, we had spoken before the NFVF started because they only came in 1997. We spoke about audience development. We spoke about the fact that the ticket that Kinecorp sells should actually, we should be able to take a percentage of the ticket cost towards building a develop, to develop content. And our question at the time was for children. I am now 56. I started this 25 years ago. My company is 25 years old and I'm having the same conversation. It is really scary. And it's scary for people like yourselves because that is part of their, all of you, what you are saying is fair and is necessary, but how, what are we going to do? Because we cannot be arguing with Nirvana, because all Nirvana does is she has a mandate by the, from the broadcaster who tells her what to do. Isabel is talking about Fru. We were part of Fru. Someone killed Fru and sold all the content to Mnet, and we lost our content. And somebody said to me, I'll pay you 5,000 rand, $5,000 for your content for life. I basically said, I won't show the finger. But that's what we had to do. So this process of producing content for those people who think we can just go broadband or we can just you know, stream our content, if we could do that, sir, we would have done that 20 years ago. We cannot. And this is the challenge. Where do we go to from here? This was innovation and disruption. I want to thank the young people who came with poetry and came with creative industries and came to challenge us. But now, we need to be challenging. The government is telling us here. They say they're moving with this digital, with the fourth revolution. You need to, as somebody else said, it's not toy toy if we have to write that letter that Le Bon is going to do and we're all going to sign and we're going to say 72 million rand from NFVF is not enough money to produce content and that is what we have to do. I think that for all of us to look at what it means to innovate, whether it is in animation, live action, the problem, and as much as we're excited about Netflix, that is our culture, that is our IP. And what are we doing? We're giving it away for a couple of hundreds of thousands of rand because our own government and our own people will not give us the money for what belongs to us. So I give, I, yes, I can sell my shoes. Remember when everybody was wearing those, uh, we won't talk about the, the red sole shoes. I think the point that we need to know is what is ours what is the value of what we have, the value of our content, the value of who we are as South Africans and as Africans, and to stand up and not just be excited about Netflix and give them on a platter our stories. Can I just make a quick follow-up from what Mam Feltoza has, has, has said? Um, Mama, I really appreciate what you are teaching us right now as young people. It, uh, it's very scary for me. I'm turning 30 just next year. And guess what? I didn't even know about the charter that you, you just mentioned, ma'am. And that is a problem because if Abba Zalbe to bang us fund this in M common and bandana no ma im tete by bere pambilin, then see a fan and name pumput. We are like a bunch of 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 blind people who are dragging each other. And I don't know which direction we are heading to. It's very important in Ampel. And in Tangela Yoba for Yotwa. 
As we are saying, ma, the world as we know it, especially, let me, let me use American and Britain, they've run out of content, which is why Netflix is coming to Africa. And if Tina, we're going to allow them to come and disrupt, we should be the ones that are disrupting them because they're the ones that don't have content. We are the ones with the content, which is a gold mine. <laughs> Not so long ago, uh, our current president, Umama was there. Uh, President Honorable Cyril Ramaphosa, he, he, he made a statement. This is a, 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 a park town, a Moeni hotel. He said, the resources of the country have exhausted and we have now identified a new gold mine that we are looking to expropriate, which is the creative industry. When the government starts expropriating this creative industry, they need to do it on our terms. We need to make sure as young people, Guti, all young people, including our legends, it's very sad to have our legends dying as paupers because we don't address issues. We've got this tendency of saying, I hear so no, 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 we must address it now. There's one thing I want to tell you, Ma. I always say it, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the, the future of this country, I'm the current. And as the current, if I do not pave a way for the future, then generations to come are doomed. Hence why we need to address these issues. And as young people, Ma, we're going to come to you. We need more of this history, and we need to know how the, the, the national broadcaster, which was once a staring of us, to young, of us young people, we need to know how it was structured, how it was built brick by brick for it to be where it is, so that we can know how to properly expropriate it and bring it back to us, because it belongs to us at the end of the day. Thank you. So um, it, it was really just uh, one of the things when we were talking about funding, we haven't heard anything about crowdfunding um, and that, that clearly. But on the issue of um, sort of the government funding, I think it's really important as we come out of the summit, it's not, it, it's not going to help anybody to say we need money in the generic. Um, the government needs programs. I'll use the example of the film incentive, the DTI film incentive. In fact, that was originally a program of arts and culture, DOC and DTI. We, and I, I'm saying we because uh, it was a team of people uh, that was involved from the three departments, developed a, a memorandum that went to cabinet. Cabinet said, yes, you, we give you 5.3 billion rand. This was 2002. But we want you to come back with programs because we can't just spend money, right? The only department, the only department was DTI. We're still waiting for DOC. We're still waiting for arts and culture. So there was 5.3 billion rand that just that went. It was committed. But the, 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 so the point that I'm making is we're moving into a new administration post-May. The president has said there are going to be new departments. There's going to be a new configuration of government. Let's think ahead. Let's not build new houses with old bricks. Let's come with new departments. Let's come with departments of digital economy. Let's come with... So those are the sort of things. And then look to government as a whole and say, government, your industrial development programs, where does creative industries fit there? It's not the department that organizes parties and cocktail dues. It's a department that's driving digital economy. Thanks. Okay, I think we've reached the end of this session. I mean, as we're talking, you can see a number of resolutions coming out and also maybe an innovation fund for programming, a particular department that needs to be set up. So there are a lot of things that are already becoming resolutions that we need to push forward. Um, can I um, ask that we all go out for 10 minutes or so and that those who would like to participate in half an hour of just putting this all together as a report and making sure that their resolutions and concerns are, are part of what we've captured. Um, can you come back into this room and participate? Otherwise, you can email both of us and we can make our emails available um, if you want us to take up some of your issues and some of the resolutions. Uh, what we're going to do with that is to report back tomorrow from this group 
and we want to try and turn it into resolutions for the departments of arts and culture. But thank you, everyone, for your participation. Thank you so much for the panel's participation. Um, Nirvana, sorry to put you on the hot seat, but you were very good. Thank you. And thank you to the audience for your participation.